All right, so just to share with you the current status of healthcare in America, um, digestive system. I think, actually, let's just do this by body region and see if we can do this from memory. Okay, digestion starts in the mouth. mouth. What happens in the mouth? What do we do with that food? We chew it up. That's called mastication. And the purpose of mastication is to? Increase, increase surface area. We're also going to mix it with? Saliva. Saliva from the salivary glands. What functions does saliva have? Moistening. Makes the bolus wet so you can swallow it so it doesn't get stuck in your throat. Allows you to taste because you can't stick anything on your taste buds unless it's in solution. Helps to lubricate, cleanse the mouth in between meals. That's why you create saliva in between meals is to push that stuff out of your mouth and it starts the digestion of carbohydrates, carbohydrates with salivary amylase. What chemicals are in saliva that besides washing the mineral or the particles out of your mouth in between meals also helps to keep the growth of bacteria down? IgA, so antibody immunoglobulin A, and another chemical called lysozyme. Those are going to be your attributes of <laughs> saliva. Once you get it all chewed up and watered into a ball in the back of your tongue, we call it a bolus. bolus. And the next organ that it's going to move into after the mouth is the pharynx, the back of the throat, and from the pharynx it moves into the esophagus. esophagus. What mode of movement occurs when we swallow to go from the pharynx to the stomach? Yeah, but motor, mode of movement. Peristalsis, because the other kind of movement is called what? And basically what segmentation? Mushing it back and forth, mixing and churning to get those digestive enzymes mixed in and to move that food across the brush borders. We don't want to do that in the throat. Okay, so then it gets to the stomach. Um, the stomach produces what secretion? Okay, bigger picture. G word? Gastric juice. And gastric juice is made out of a chemical which you just said called hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid. Gastrin is going to be a hormone. <laughs> it just fits so well. <laughs> Gastric juice is made out of hydrochloric acid, and hydrochloric acid is secreted by what cell? What? Parietal cells. Parietal cells also make another secretion called intrinsic factor. And I saw on the quiz, some of you guys got mixed up with the function of intrinsic factor because what does intrinsic factor actually do for the process of digestion? Absorption of vitamin B12. So B12 is a really hard vitamin, I guess, to absorb. And so this assists with the absorption of B12. So we've got to have that intrinsic factor. And FYI, the reason why people who have gastric bypass surgery often have anemia is because it's the fundus, it's that little puffy thing on the top of the stomach, that's where most of the intrinsic cells that make, or the parietal cells that make intrinsic factor are housed. And so when you have gastric bypass surgery, that's the part of the stomach that's most often lopped off or banded off. And so you lose the function of those parietal cells and intrinsic factor. Then we have another cell that makes pepsinogen. Those are chief cells. What activates pepsinogen and turns it into pepsin? Hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid. And the purpose of pepsin is to begin? Digestion of proteins. So the hydrochloric acid and the pepsin work together as a team to help digest proteins. How do they work together as a team? The acid denatures and the pepsin. There you go. So the acid denatures the proteins, causes them to unravel makes it easier to get at those covalent bonds. And so then the pepsin, which is an enzyme, gets at those covalent bonds and breaks them apart into smaller peptides. Um, we have three phases. Oh, what is the name of the structure 
that's in the stomach that helps it to expand when we eat a whole lot of food. Rugae. So we've got rugae or pleats in the stomach. And the production of gastric juice occurs in three phases. What is the first phase called? The cephalic phase. And what stimulates the production of gastric juice during the cephalic phase? Sight, smell, or thought of food. So think Pavlov's dog. Ring the bell. What do we start doing? Salivating and producing gastric juice. Second phase is called gastric phase. What stimulates that? Stretch. Stretch of the stomach. So we stretch out the stomach and that's going to help to activate the release of what chemical? Gastrin. And the gastrin is secreted <laughs> by... Stole my answer. Damn it. <laughs> you got to beat her up here. Damn you. Um, what cells are responsible for the production of gastrin? Just so you recognize the name of the cell. G cells. And so a G cell, it's easy to see gastrin from that. They are a type of diffuse neuroendocrine cell or DNS cells. So that's just one example. Um, and then we have our third phase, which is intestinal phase. So in the first phase and second phase, what happens to the amount of gastric juice produced? Increases. How is that different with the intestinal phase? Decreases. You happen to remember the chemical that's released as soon as chyme goes into the small intestine that's gonna provide negative feedback and make it slow down? That's not what's going to provide chemical communication with the stomach though. Yes, you do have bicarb secreted there, but that doesn't communicate with the stomach. Secreted? I'm just No. Gastric inhibitory peptide. Gastric inhibit. Yeah, it kind of makes sense based upon the term, doesn't it? Um, let's see. Yeah. Is it secreting? Yeah. Is it actually? It might provide some of that negative feedback. I always think of gastric inhibitory peptide because it's so obvious. It's like, oh yeah, I know what that does. Let's see. Is there anything else that we need to remember about the stomach? Um, when the pyloric sphincter opens up, how much chyme comes out at a time? A little bit. Just a little bit. Reason behind that? Okay, so then a little bit of chyme goes into the first section of the small intestine called the? Duodenum. duodenum. And the duodenum receives secretions from what and what? Uh, liver, and gallbladder. Gallbladder. The liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. pancreas. So it's pancreatic juice from the pancreas, and what from the liver and gallbladder? Bile. Bile. And when that happens, it's going to cause the small intestine to release what two hormones? Secretin and CCK, cholecystokinin. And together, those two hormones do what? To the liver, gallbladder, and pink, uh, pancreas. Cause the creation and something of production and secretion of bile, bile and pancreatic juice. Okay. So those are the two hormones that are really responsible. That's why I'm thinking secretin, it might provide negative feedback on the stomach, but what do I want to stick in your head? Production and release of pancreatic juice and of um, bile. What is the purpose of bile? It does what? What's that word? It starts with the Emulsifies. Emulsifies fats. And what is emulsification? A type of mechanical or enzymatic degradation? Mechanical. Because all it does, it doesn't break any bonds. It simply takes a large fat droplet and puts it into smaller fat droplets so that what enzyme from the pancreatic juice can get in there and do its job breaking down the covalent bonds? Lipase. And here's one that got, you guys were in the right ballpark, but you didn't nail it. What is the name of the enzyme secreted by the pancreas, which is going to digest proteins? Protease, so pancreatic protease, what is the name of the enzyme that breaks down DNA and RNA? Nucleases. Nucleases. And then what is the name of one of the enzymes 
fat is going to then break down carbohydrates secreted by the pancreas. Pancreatic amylase. So we have salivary amylase and then pancreatic amylase. And so that covers your four major categories. And so when I ask for an enzyme that breaks down from the pancreas, I want you to get specific. What happened on the quiz is many people just said pancreatic enzymes. Well, that's kind of broad. I want the specific enzyme because you guys were taught the specific <laughs> enzymes. What is the other component of pancreatic juice that's so essential? We named the four enzymes. That gets secreted along with bicarbonate. And if you were to categorize bicarbonate, we categorize it as what kind of a molecule? A base. And so what's its job? To neutralize the acid. So we're using a little bit of your chemistry background here to help you understand what what's going on. Holy crap. It's a chemistry <laughs> question. You got it right. Hot diggity freaking dog. <laughs> what pH do we typically bring? Oh, what do we call that secretion after it enters the stomach and small intestine? It's no longer a bolus. Chyme. Chyme. So what do we bring the pH of the chyme up to at that point? Seven. Round seven. So we really do neutralize it. It brings it up to about a seven. So the first part of the small intestine is your duodenum. And the one thing you want to remember about the duodenum is that is where Neutral. you receive the secretions from a bile and pancreatic juice and you neutralize the chyme. Then it moves into the second section called the? The what? Jejunum. And what did you want to remember about jejunum? The main area for chemical digestion and absorption occurs in the jejunum, and it goes into the last section called the ileum. ileum. What's at the end of the ileum? ileum. ileum. And what's the purpose of that? It's a microbiome. Yeah, so to regulate the movement of chyme into the colon and to stop the movement of many bacteria up into the small intestine. Small intestine has three structures which increase surface area for chemical digestion and absorption. The first circular. structure is circular folds. circular folds and on those circular folds you have finger-like processes called villi. and on the villi you have little itty bitty ones called microvilli. And collectively you call all that microvilli villi the brush border enzyme or brush border and they produce those enzymes. So. That is our last set of enzymes. Um, oh, you know something which I didn't ask you? Big picture. What are the three main forces, I don't know what better word to use, that are going to control the whole digestive process? Three main things involved in controlling this whole process of digestion. Parasympathetic nervous system is going to increase motility and basically turn it on. The enteric nervous system, which is the set of neurons, which is just specific to your digestive viscera and don't really need a whole lot of input. Those are your short reflexes and hormones, which we have already talked about. And we've you know, your vagus nerve is going to be your primary cranial nerve developing parasympathetic or uh, providing parasympathetic nerve innervation. Okay, so that gets us to the colon. First thing we need to do is make sure that we're familiar with the colon. The first little blind end pouch in the colon is called the? Cecum. Cecum. And then it goes up? Descending. Cross. Down. Descending. Rolls 45. Six. And the last six inches. Six. Rectum, ending in internal two anal sphincters, internal and external. So functions of the colon include is it four or three? Water, absorption. water absorption, so that we don't have diarrhea. Electrolyte absorption, housing the microbiome, and absorbing vitamins produced by the microbiome, and storing feces until we're ready to defecate. So when we're ready to defecate, there's like a three or four step process, depending upon how you look at it. What starts the process of defecation? Stretch. Stretch. Stretch of the rectum. And that information gets sent to the spinal cord, and what happens? The spinal cord processes it. Okay, what 
what this has got to be part of your oh, yeah. motor your efferent nervous system what kind of a command is the spinal cord going to send back and to where what's the effector it's involuntary so which which one is it going to be so it's going to be a parasympathetic nerve response to the internal. internal sphincter allowing it to release and that's when you start doing the dance because now you only have one sphincter holding the poo back and so how are you going to release that Somatic. A somatic, a voluntary motor command to the external sphincter, allowing it to release, which will allow you to poop. Um, oh, that was another mistake that I saw on your quiz when I went over the quiz questions. So a couple of questions where there's a lot of people that missed it. The question that I asked was, which one of these is not in the colon or something like that? And I put circular folds, villi and microvilli. You don't find that in the colon. Remember looking at the pictures of the colon with gluten and celiac disease? You didn't see any circular folds. That is only a thing of the small intestine. That's not included in the large intestine. That, those structures are only found in the small intestine. Okay, next up, functions of the microbiome. Produce vitamins such as vitamin K, which is important for blood clotting. What? Keep your gut healthy. Okay, this is all part of it. These are ways that it helps metabolize undigested food particles, some of which it can turn into valuable nutrients, such as essential fatty acids that we can't manufacture on our own, and creating competition to help keep out bad bacteria. Yeah, stimulating the immune system. Notice how functions, four functions going to see a question about that somehow. Okay, and that takes us through pooping. Mm. Okay, going back, what is the job of the gallbladder? Store. Store and concentrate bile, because we want to have that concentrated bile to help with the emulsification of lipids. And then what are some functions of the liver? Its primary um, digestive function is to produce bile, and then along outside of digestion, what does it do? Detoxifies toxins in your body. So when you inhale and, or you ingest mercury or something like that, what does it receive from the colon, small intestine, stomach, and spleen? Yeah, what's that called? Hepatic portal system. So all those newly digested nutrients are going to go to the liver for processing and that ties in with um, getting rid of toxins because it's quite possible that you have absorbed bacteria and toxins when you're absorbing that food and so that's part of the processing. What else does the liver do with that newly digested food? What's the liver known to store? Glycogen. So this is a way of restocking glycogen stores and that's why on that case study, um, Oh, did I hand those back? Yeah, I need to get those. That is why on that case study, it was like, why is this dude who has cirrhosis prone to hypoglycemic events? Well, if you have a sick liver, is it going to be able to store glycogen properly? No, and so it's not gonna be good at helping to regulate blood glucose levels. You guys were thinking, you were saying that, well, he's just drinking booze, he's not eating good food, and that is true, but you need to go back to the functions of the liver and how does that in fact affect hypoglycemia. What else does the liver do? Makes a lot of, and these are used for blood clotting and blood colloid osmotic pressure. Remember all those different proteins which are made by the liver? So albumin for blood colloid osmotic pressure. Most of the clotting proteins are going to be made that angiotensinogen, which we haven't even covered yet. We'll get that in the renal chapter. That's going to be made by the liver. Um, and we covered functions of the pancreas already. I think we just about made it out of the box. Let's see if I missed it here. Freeform. I think we did pretty good. Yeah, we covered those three. Yeah. That's a beautiful one. I wanted to see the, the 
Divine fiber cups. We covered the different cells. Wow. Grata cells, chief cells, diffuse neuroendocrine cells. Get it? Oh. Parietal cells also produce, his, or G cells produce the histamine. Remember that? It's one of those weird things to think of histamine as causing capillaries to become leaky and vasodilation, but here in the stomach, triggers additional secretion from parietal cells. So that brings up GERD. Causes of GERD would include obesity. What? Caffeine consumption, so your diet can definitely contribute to the development of GERD. Hilcobor, <laughs> And so what are some ways that we treat GERD? Antacid, so Tums, and how do they treat it? Neutralize. They're a base and they immediately neutralize it. Then what else can we use to treat GERD? What? Is it the HNT2 blocker or protein pump blocker? Okay, yeah, let's keep it with protein, so protein pump. Inhibitor. Yes. That What's that shut down? Your protein pumps. So the your parietal cells. I want you to be able to relate, relate this to what you study. So your parietal cells are the proton pumps. Okay. And so by shutting down your parietal cells, that's what you're shutting down when you shut down your hydrochloric acid pumps. That's your proton pump. And you have to be really careful with those because when you're on those long term, and I understand some people, you know, GERD is really, really bad but you need acid to digest many of those minerals and to deactivate the bacteria and stuff like that. So shutting them down for an extended period of time, you might be setting yourself up for trouble. And then antibiotics. How would antibiotics help with GERD? Yeah, that's gonna target the Helicobacter pylori because when you're producing too much acid, that creates an environment that's conducive to the over multiplication of these extremophiles. And when you get too many of them, what do they do to the wall of the stomach? Hole through it. Eat a hole through it, and that's what creates a, a um, hernia. All right, so antacid, oh, histamine blockers. That yeah, was one I forgot. The HMD2 blocker. That's right? where you're going, your histamine yeah. blocker. So that's going to also decrease the production of hydrochloric acid. It really ulcers, not hernias. Right? Did I say hernia? You did say hernia. Yeah. yeah. Ulcers. Okay, yes, ulcers. <laughs> hernias, ulcers. They're homeostatic abnormalities. All right, we covered the three, three sections the there, <laughs> the three structures which increase surface area. What's the purpose of the lacteal? <laughs> to oh, transport collect fats. Yeah, because capillaries in the small intestine are too small. And okay, so let's just finish this up no, not these with, remember at the very end here, we did our roundabout. Let's just review it again. So carbohydrate digestion begins in the mouth, mouth with mouth. salivary amylase, and it's completed in the small, small intestine. intestine with fresh water enzymes. Fresh water enzymes. And? Pancreatic amylase. Lipid digestion begins in the stomach with gastric lipase and lingual lipase. And then it's going to be completed in the small intestine by what emulsifies it? Bile. And then what can get out those covalent bonds? Pancreatic lipase. Protein digestion begins in the stomach. stomach with what two chemicals? First, hydrochloric acid to denature, pepsin to then enzymatically degrade those covalent bonds. And protein digestion is completed in the small intestine by fresh water enzymes and pancreatic proteases. And you don't need to get so fancy with me, trypsin and chymotrypsin, like some of you did on the quiz. We're just going with proteases, which we'll cover all of them, because there's more like seven different enzymes which are created by the small intestine and pancreas for digesting proteins, but we don't need to be memorizing all of them. All right, so there is that.
Any questions at all on metabolism? Okay, I think it's time for a five minute break. I will run and get your